I'm going to speak about very specific use cases of what Brian just did a fabulous job of explaining what blockchain as a technology is. But before we do that, a bit of introduction. I've been in healthcare all my life in healthcare insurance. Uh, started my journey as an intern at Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Dakota. They didn't know what to do with me, so they stuck me in the mailroom. As I posted in the basement, figured something out. 20 years later, I had the privilege of being the CIO of, that, of the organization, so I learned everything along the way and how insurance works. And also learned along the way what we need to do differently. So I come at this from a very personal experience. And one of the pivotal points in my life uh, while I was at Blue Cross is my son, who was born about four years ago, was born with a lot of developmental difficulties. And my wife basically gave up her job to coordinate his care. And I got to question, how come with all the fancy systems you spent literally hundreds of millions of dollars building and proudly operating in these big data centers? don't serve the need of a child when you need care coordination, and how many processes and how much bureaucracy I had put in place because they need to be put in place. So there was a personal incentive to say, okay, stop. We gotta talk about patient engagement, provider empowerment, and payer administrative capabilities a bit differently. And my personal view has been that we build these wonderful silos, whether we call them eligibility systems, or enrollment, or member management, or care management, or or adjudication systems, and then we buy more software to integrate them, and then we buy yet more software to get them to talk to the provider, and really that integration never works. So at the end of the day, what brought me here to this journey in soft care is the idea that let's connect people, let's stop trying to connect systems as the answer to, to building the effective healthcare delivery model. We're gonna talk a lot about really the patient, the provider, and the payer as a triangle, and how we can really bring them together in a better way. And this is a platform that tries to do that. Brian, before me, did a fabulous job of explaining blockchain to you and how it works. So I'm not gonna repeat that content. I can't do better than what Brian just did. But what it does be, uh, bear repetition is that we can use the chain as a fabric to connect people. We can use the chain as a fabric to connect the patient provider, payer, regulator, employer, broker, and uh, other care providers into a patient-centric fabric, which does not require a rethink of our legacy systems. We will still need an eligibility system in the near term. We will still need to have data access and privacy. But there is a way to bridge this big chasm of none of you, I believe, as a consumer, have a mainframe in your living room with all the software that you need to connect to, the, to my system in the, the data centers that I happen to build and operate. And all of you are in the same position. As organizations, we have all the data and content, but we can't push it out reliably to the people who need it, timely enough, be it to the provider for eligibility or the, or the patient for their care protocols and so on and so forth. So blockchain is, think of it as a ledger that we all share, but what do we really use for can be very different. So instead of just thinking about blockchain as a distributed ledger, let's think about how a distributed ledger can change care coordination, care administration, and care payments. That's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. So the idea is that if you imagine that you are the sponsor of a blockchain, whether it's your only chain or it's a consortium of the parties that came together and said all of us in the state of Nebraska will share a chain, it is a question of implementation. That if there is a chain, whether sponsored or consortium, then we can all be nodes on that chain. We can participate in that chain either as a consumer, a member, policyholder, employer, broker, provider, <coughs> medical organization, hospital delivery system, individual pharmacy or a pharmacy network. We are just nodes, right? I just need an entry point on the node on the chain to have a role. The role is the key. What role do I play in the chain <coughs> is set by the sponsor? So to do this kind of a consumer-centric model, we have envisioned our own healthcare operating system, if you will, using blockchain. But this is just an example. Don't look at the actual implementation of how software is doing it to manifest it in your world. You can do it slightly differently. But the idea is very clear. You have a chain on which you can define roles. The roles are participants of your network. We can have member-only role, right? We're gonna connect all our member policyholders on the chain and issue them their eligibility and their copay and deductible information. And it's gonna be cryptographically <coughs> signed and it, once it's on the chain, it can be shared from the patient to the provider, and I don't need to be caught. I don't need an eligibility call center. I 
don't need an eligibility portal, I don't need you to call me and verify that is your plan active, and I certainly don't need you to call me and see what my copay deductible is today. Same goes for provider directory, same goes for many of the things that cause inbound call volume, because a node can read the chain, as Brian just said, we can all share the same data. So I can push out the provider directory and let you read the block called provider directory. And I can push out a change to the provider directory and let you read that block automatically. So there is an elimination of me being seen as the keeper of the data. I can be more the facilitator or the sponsor of the chain. So the way our system is designed, and this is just a framework for you to think about, there is a blockchain as a protocol on which you can define entities and tie them into relationships with each other. Me and my member, you the provider and me as the as a contract administrator, the patient and the provider directly with each other. On top of it, you can issue, and this goes back to the question I heard earlier uh, that you asked Brian, how do I make sure the data that is on the chain is only read by people who are authorized to do so? So we have envisioned a product called Care, Pro Care Wallet, which is in the hands of every node holder, whether you are a patient or a provider or, a, or your payer yourself, or you are an administrator or a regulator, or you are a reinsurer, you all have care wallets, and those care wallets, when they register on the chain, they give you your role. And based on your role, you get certain cards. And those cards are your windows into the blocks. So if I'm an adjudicator of claims, I only get to read the claim card, which means I can only read the block that contains claim data subject to what's assigned to me. So you can have a distributed ledger. You can all have a common way to access the ledger, but you only get to see the part of the ledger that your cards permit, and that's how you implement security. This is one framework. There are probably six other ways you can do it, but if you think about the concept, the idea is I have an access portal in my hand called the care wallet. In that wallet, I have cards that are relevant to my role on the chain. So if I'm a member, what do I get in my, in my, car, uh, in my wallet? Let me jump to how that would work. A member gets directly from the pair the eligibility card, which means I have now a cryptographically signed card that I can send to my provider in their wallet and I don't need the provider to call either you or me to verify my eligibility, because it's an untamped, immutable, signed by you, but shared by me information that is guaranteed to be as accurate as a call center or the call. Except it eliminates all needs for data entry and all needs for integrating systems and you know, having my ER system talk to your practice management system, all that goes away. Because I basically am giving you a fully accessible way to read the chain. Similarly, when I issue, when a provider sends me a claim, and I'm gonna pay part of it and issue an EOB to the member, I don't need to do any of that. The fact that a claim arrived in my wallet now automatically triggers the member's awareness of the fact that I've adjudicated the claim, I'm gonna pay $72 out of 80 bill, and I have a copay left of $5 after we price it, okay? There's no need for any of that transactional administrative flows that to the member, it looks like policemen of care. We don't want to be seen as policemen of care, right? Our job is to facilitate care. Our job is to get the member out of the hospital quickly, not to make them feel like we're gonna block care, which is never really the function, that's how it appears, because we have all these administrative steps we have to make them go through. Another simple example is consents. Do I really need the member to give perpetual consent to the provider, and how many of you have ever gone in and revoked the HIPAA consent you gave to a physician? But that was not never the intent, right? It was never meant to be blanket grant forever and perpetually. It was always meant to be, you will use my consent to treat me for the duration that you are my physician, and after that, that consent has no more validity. So let me ask you another question. Who does the data belong to? When I go to the physician and I visit them, you've all been to a physician or taken somebody there. Your data, who does it belong to? It should. Who does it belong to? The answer is both. Right? The provider has rights to the data to protect their liability risk and to treat you well and to follow up and to bill and so on and so forth, but there's also your data. So in blockchain, you can actually co-share data. The idea is that you can have a vault or a record that is co-owned, which means that I grant you permission and you grant me permission, and if you both agree, only then a third party can see it. So which means I can revoke my consent and thereby make the data inaccessible to anybody else, even though you have residency of it. So let's separate the residency of data, which is in the EMR system, from ownership of data, which is in the chain. So you can link a chain as a consent management tool on top of existing record-keeping systems, say, but 
This data is co-owned. My signature digitally with Touch ID on my phone will be required for this cabinet to be unlocked. This is how you can manage a completely different way of managing relationships. What I'm talking about, we've been building for a few years, so um, after I left Blue Cross, this is what I've been doing. So we are actually implementing a variety of use cases for a variety of payers, accountable care organizations, clinical organizations. So we just launched this platform in summer for an accountable care organization in Arizona that is owned by Dignity Health Systems and Tenet. And we are currently using this chain to pay providers for value-based contracts. So the notion here is a provider has absolute complete transparency into how much they have earned in their, in their gain share, as it is called, as part of delivering value-based care. And I, as an ACO, have clear understanding of how, my, how much my providers are earning, and most importantly, where they are not taking care of the patient as well as they should, which is why they're not earning their reward. And as a pair who is sponsoring all this care, I want to make sure that your A1C is checked every time you go see the doctor because you are at risk from diabetes. And I do want to make sure that you're not missing out on those checks just because the provider forgot because I have pre-authorized that care day one. So why aren't you getting your checkup? Because I don't want you to develop a severe case. So this whole automatic coordination and alignment of incentives is the model of a shared ledger. That's what the blockchain does. I can tell you that all the use cases we can imagine today will pale in comparison to the stuff you would do in three, five years. Because there is so much can be done when you start rethinking the notion of everybody comes to me, I authorize care, I send referral authorization out, I tell you who the provider directory is, I tell you what the claim value is. All of that replaces into, I'm putting this decision and the content, as Brian said, contract is my decision tree, is that why I made the decision? There is a content and here is the outcome. All that's from the chain, and only those who need to see the data can see it. Which means I'm not going to be flying with my kimono wide open, but I can certainly instantly give access to people who are who are in, who need to see it. So these are some of the use cases we have um, in flight right now. My personal favorite is a is a program we're launching again in Arizona around mother baby care uh, for a specially disadvantaged population group where our goal is to get the child in for a pediatric visit in the first 12 months of their life. That ratio right now sits at 17%, meaning 83 out of 100 kids never go into a first year visit. That's startling. We know it leads to tremendous amount of costs and complications in year two and beyond. So we are launching a platform where we are issuing the care wallet to the caseworker as well as to the, to the mothers who are both expectant and already have children to have this pre-authorized care and instant access to pediatric, pediatric care in the form of a uh, demand-based appointment. Let me jump to one other exciting use case. Uh, this is in development right now with a major transportation provider in, uh, that all of you have heard of. Brian mentioned the idea of Uber. We, one of the ways you can use blockchain as an example is to change scheduling upside down. Today, when my wife needs to get Edwin to the hospital, to the pediatric, She's on the phone, calling the front desk, on hold for 15 minutes. Yes, this is going, you can bring him in next Thursday at 3 p.m. Wait, that doesn't work. That's his school time. That's his therapy time. Well, then how about in six weeks from now on, at 2 p.m. on a certain Thursday? This is how appointments work, right? It's a long journey to find the right appointment. And even in highly populated, highly serviced areas, and we imagine what happens in low access, low availability area, and it's staggering percentages there. Instead, you can use the chain to put the request for appointment on the chain. So I have a card in my wallet that says I need to bring in Edwin at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, ideally, or around that time. That event hits the chain. Every physician wallet can respond to that request and say, yep, no different than Uber. Yes, my schedule is open, and I'm going to let the wallet automatically shake hands and lock your appointment in. But even more interesting is I require you to send me your eligibility card as part of a handshake. So I don't need you to have to call your insurer. You will deliver me a cryptographically signed eligibility card along with the appointment handshake. So none of us need to do anything. I know when you show up that you are eligible on the day of the appointment. The day I see you, that card has been automatically updated by the latest information from your eligibility file. And as a result, I don't need to call the insurer yet again and say, are you still eligible? Is Pradeep still on the plan? Yes, he is. Your card is still signed to be accurate. <coughs> You see how much bureaucracy we got rid of. We all know the metrics around number of minutes spent on care versus number of minutes spent pre-care and post-care in physician setting. 
there's not a physician who says, ah, I just don't do enough administrative work. I need to do that. <laughs> and they blame us for all that, right? How much more do you want me to submit? How many more documents am I supposed to get from us? Get ready for you. This is a different way of approaching it. And what's important is that that event in the chain could be visible to the pair, because you are a node, and it could be visible to the employer, saying, yep, he does have a real appointment, confirmed appointment, so when he says sick leave, it's not a made up leave, he's actually going there. And then tying that to, and I've covered some of this eligibility verification without needing any clearinghouse or call center, but I'll go to this really interesting option. In some of the public program entities that we're working with, um, they also want to make sure that the patient has transportation to get to the physician. The no-show rate for Medicaid population in Arizona is over 40%. So four out of 10 appointments are not kept, right? So that me, gives me, as a physician, very low incentive to give you an appointment. Because if you're not going to show up four out of 10 times, I'm going to waste revenue opportunity to serve a low revenue patient to begin with. No, thank you very much. Creates invisible barriers to care that we all know about, but we don't know what to do with them. We try to incentivize them, we try to punish them, we try to reward them, but at the end of the day, it's all about economics and simplicity. If you're not going to show up four out of 10 times, I'm going to give somebody else preferential appointment over you. The, the linkage with this is that the moment a certain type of appointment is made with a physician, a regulatory body or a facilitator of care, like an accountable care organization or a Medicaid agency, cannot issue a Uber or a Lyft card into my wallet saying, you are going for what is considered a medically important appointment, such as a one-year checkup for your child. We want you to go in. Here is your card. It's only usable to go to see this physician from either your home, work, or school. That's it. You can't sell this card in the market. You can't trade it for cigarettes. You cannot <laughs> abuse this card. But this card will get you to the doctor and back. So this is the type of things that transparency in the real time, tied to a chain that is immutable, allows us to really rethink the way we deliver care. The goal in all this is, is blockchain a panacea? Absolutely not. Right? Blockchain is yet another technology with a lot of promise, but also a lot of caveats. Uh, before we heard internet will solve the world, but internet, internet made the world a lot better, brought its own set of ills, privacy and data security. Then we heard the service oriented architecture will connect everybody, we'll all live this wonderfully interoperable world, well, we're still waiting for that, but it did make things better, and the same is true for blockchain. It will solve some problems that are intractable today, it certainly will not solve every issue in the world, but if you use it right, it has tremendous potential but it does require you to rethink your processes. We are so used to having command and control in our office as a pair. Blockchain will force you to say, and will give you the opportunity rather to say, do I really need to be doing this? Do I need to have 72% eligibility call center when I can just literally issue a cryptographically pure, signed, immutable record, which is no worse or no better than the phone call coming in. And it eliminates all my front end issue. And by the way, patient providers can see the same data in real time. Oh, and I don't have to build another app to give it to them. I can literally put my data on the chain. And this is the point I want you to understand. The care wallet, the care cards, the care point, the care water are manifestations of how you read the chain. But it's in the end, all you're doing is really putting the data on the chain and, and controlling who has access to it through some kind of a tool in the hands of the node, the person who's connected to the chain, and saying, this is how you read my chain. We imagine that to be care wa wallet, which is multi-party wallet, so I don't have to issue a Blue Cross wallet and an Aetna wallet and a Cigna wallet and a United wallet. I just have a card that I can issue to any wallet in the world, and therefore I don't have this need to keep issuing my own applications. But you could do it differently. The point is, if you're big enough, have a big enough membership, you could say, my own care wallet is going to play. Or you could use a consortium model. So this idea of the chain is really to say, it's a secure proof. The last thing I want to talk about, and I'll let you I'll go is, let's reverse the model. Let's get out of the picture and think about doctor-patient. Um, my, a lot of my family members are physicians, and, and thankfully I didn't get into that business, although I was from childhood told, doctor or engineer, that's what you get to be, so that's <laughs> an engineer. But the, the, the issue is about care continuity. I go see the doctor, they give me a prescription, they treat me for certain symptoms, I disappear, come back 90 days later, my condition is 10 times worse, what the heck happened for you? Did you not take the medication? Did you start feeling bad last week or a month ago? And all these care continuity gaps that lead to very poor outcomes in very expensive situations, particularly in chronic and pre-chronic conditions. So the idea of the blockchain is, you can, let's use 
the chain as a way to keep the patient engaged. Let's have the provider issue a how are you feeling today card. This is our term for care continuity card where I can ask specific disease specific questions that the member will answer. If they don't answer, family members can intervene and say, knock, knock, buddy, you better answer this question. You're part of a certain disease management program. We need to know how your diabetic you know, the metrics are going. And based on that response, the carrier, the member, and the provider can decide what data is usable and agree upon sharing. So I, I as a patient can decide only my provider can see the content or my kids can see it too, which actually we use in my case. My daughter always calls me every morning and the name came from this, how are you feeling today? This is the first question, 6 a.m. every day. Hi dad, how are you feeling today? And I always say to her, I'm fine. And she's like, BS. You were tired <laughs> yesterday, you had allergies the day before. What do you mean you're doing? Tell me the truth. So from that came the idea that let's actually create a patient care continuity framework that physicians can use. And then if necessary, in a certain program setting, with appropriate consent, care coordinators can use to make sure that I'm getting the care that I, that I need. So, and there are other use cases that I'm happy to send this deck out to you. Claim submission by member, uh, real-time adjudication and real-time payment to providers. Those all become very, uh, we can rethink all those processes. Why? And I'll, I'll tell you an artifact and then I'll wrap up. You know, as a in adjudication system builder, designer, architect, my number one job was to recreate history from 90 days ago. I had to figure out how do I make sure that the claim I'm paying actually did deserve to be paid and did the services indeed get delivered? Did the patient have to show up? Did the provider do all these procedures? And so on and so forth. Leave aside medical necessity. Just the mechanics of adjudicating a claim is all about reproducing history. The idea here is if you have a chain, I don't need to reproduce any history. I'm going to scan the ledger and adjudicate in real time and pay you in real time. I don't need to know the patient showed up because it's, there's a ledger entry where the two wallets synced and said, yep, the patient is here. I don't need 90% of the paperwork that I normally collect around my, my claims that I don't pass on first pass. So the notion again here is, let's not recreate history, let's capture history. And if history is captured immutably, then none of us need to argue over what happened. And my decisions are only, are, only, are valid because they're based on data that we all agree to be accurate. Um, wrapping up, in Arizona, we've launched a three tier, three wallets, member wallet, provider wallet, and administrative wallet, which essentially does the following functions. And we are using this framework, about 5,000 physicians and about 280,000 members that are as part of this accountable care organization is where we have tested out a lot of our ideas. And this accountable care organization is, uh, is sponsored by multiple payers. So this is a truly a payer, ACO, provider, member, uh, technology relationship that is showing real, um, very positive trends and, and very exciting prospects. These are some of the examples of um, uh, what how we pay the providers to the chain, and I'm happy to tell you that little anecdote, and, and uh, we'll wrap this up. Providers were issued their care coins on Friday at 9 a.m. last week, and they were redeemed at 9.01, meaning the providers were absolutely instantly paid for all their gain share programs, which typically takes 90 days, we sent out ACH or EFT later on. It was one minute, and, and we were getting phone calls from providers saying, well, why did it take a minute? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but we literally went from 90 days to one minute in terms of redemption of the game share award for the quarter. And that's just our first day. So we know that there is real excitement around the, the transparency of how much you're going to get paid, instant payment ability, and our ability to control and audit every transaction. So it's not a transaction that chain that we can't ultimately audit or have you audit, because it's the same chain. So with that said, um, last statement. When you think of the blockchain, think of it as a fabric. You can sponsor the fabric and put all the nodes you want on the fabric for people you care about serving. Or you can join somebody else's fabric, or both. So you can have a payer-centric fabric, a clinical fabric, or you can have uh, your, a consortium fabric. And then, based on your role on the fabric, people can share exact, precise information because you're going to give them the access to the blocks using some kind of a tool like a care wallet, care card, or whatever else you design. That's how you will implement blockchain as we look ahead. It's not necessarily, you, you, there's nothing wrong morally or philosophically to having your own chain. There's absolutely nothing wrong to having a multi pair or a statewide chain where your chain can share data. <coughs> 
<coughs> so, and as Brian said, this is not a this is not a database. This is an event-based system where you can share real-time events and content, even though content is sitting somewhere in the backend system like eligibility. A uh, little bit about us, we are uh, about a 100% company, uh, about two years old, but we have been growing very rapidly, primarily payer-centric, that's the business I grew up with, so this is really the platform we built for insurance and insurance regulators and, and uh, ACOs and PPAs and large employers who are looking to manage their benefits better. So this is the, the backdrop for this, this is not a, a chain for speculative investing or Bitcoin trading, and this is all about healthcare administration, healthcare coordination, and healthcare payments. That's where we come from. I'll be here if you have any questions. Um, I'm really honored to be here, and thank you for your time, and look forward to, to dialogue afterwards.